So um, thanks everybody for joining us. We uh, This is session number eight of our um, housing collaborative um, in uh, uh, creating equity in, uh, in HIV uh, and ending the epidemic. Um, so we have, uh, we're, we're doing something a little different today. Um, uh, we'd like you to go ahead as, as always and write into the chat if you would um, that you're here um, just so that we, we uh, know who all's here, just um, your name and the organization that you work for. My name is Kathleen Clen and I'm one of the faculty for the Housing Affinities uh, uh, section. And we're going to actually begin today with a little bit of a poll. Um, we're gonna be asking you about um, some didactic topics for, um, for later on in July. Uh, then we'll have um, the undetectable program uh, Naomi um, Tolson is going to be presenting that to it for us. It's going to be great. And then um, our case presentation today is from Erin Peterson from, from Hennepin County. Then we'll have discussion as always in our wrap up. So um, why don't we go ahead to the next, to the poll. So um, this is multiple choice. We're asking you to go ahead and just uh, check the box for any of these that you are specific interventions in terms of improving housing uh, status, housing stability for um, for our clients, and uh, which of these that you, which of these interventions, um, the top three that you would like uh, for us to make sure that we have, uh, um, you know, that we have included in our didactics. We'll give you a minute here. Yeah, there are 10 total options, um, so you have to scroll down a little bit to see all of them. And go ahead and, and pick three. In any order. All right. Can we tell... Um, how people are doing? Can we tell how many responses we have? We're about 55%, so let's give it a little bit more time. Okay. We also Thanks, have Renee. people joining us too. Yeah. So if people have just joined, we'd like you to go ahead and mark on this list, and you need to scroll down to see all of it. Mark on this list the top three things that you would like um, to hear more about in terms of um, interventions to help clients with stabilizing their housing. Okay, we're up to 60 now. All righty. Last few. Mm -hmm. 75, I think that's a good number. Right. Okay. All I'll right, people, people are still thinking, you can just go ahead and, and uh, click yours in also, but we, we will go ahead um, to uh, take a look at what, at what people have voted on so far. So it looks like trauma-informed approaches for sure. Um, training on continuous improvement and motivational interviewing are gonna turn out to be our oh, walk-in availability and access to care. So we have a tie, uh -huh. number three. All right, thank you all for this. Um, we'll, we'll use this to determine which, what to do in terms of our didactics uh, in the uh, coming month of, of July. All right, um, so let's go ahead and put the slides back up and invite Naomi to um, present the program. Awesome, well, hello everyone, good morning, afternoon, wherever you are. Um, so thank you all just for inviting me to speak a bit about the Undetectables program. Um, a little bit about myself, Naomi Harris Tolson, she, her pronouns, I'm a project manager at Housing Works, which if you're not familiar is um, a federally qualified health center based in New York City. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have four health centers kind of scattered throughout the boroughs, but we also have um, 
thrift stores and a bookstore that kind of help feed into our health services as well. Um, we do quite a bit of advocacy as well. So lots of different things going on. But today uh, I was asked to talk about um, our Undetectables program that is specifically geared towards folks who are HIV positive. Um, and a really shortened version of the program, but once again, more than happy to you know, speak with anyone one-on-one -on -one if you have any additional questions as well. Um, so go ahead to the next slide. So really quick overview, just I'm going to talk about what the background, the program model itself, as well as technical assistance, as we at HouseWorks do provide technical assistance to agencies who are interested in implementing this program or a similar version of this program into your own agencies. Uh, next slide. So program background, go ahead, next slide. So um, how, how did we get to this point? So housing works, you know, historically we've been around over 30 years at this point and really are the meat and potatoes of what we've done since the beginning is serving folks who are HIV positive, um, primarily through primary care, but we also have case management, lots of other services that I'm sure many of you probably offer to your clients at your sites. What we found, um, you know, we had case management, we had primary care, but we weren't quite moving the needle when it came to viral load suppression. Uh, we knew that some folks just needed some kind of extra support. We weren't quite meeting those needs. So after a lot of conversations with clients and uh, community leaders and staff and just all kinds of folks, we created what is now called the Undetectables. And we just celebrated seven years of the program back in March. Um, we were initially funded as a pilot through the Robin Hood Foundation, which is just a, a foundation based in New York that helps kind of fund these kind of pilot, you know, trying innovative programs to really seek change in certain populations. Um, so a lot of our patients deal with lots of different things, obviously either homeless or um, unstably housed, substance use, mental health, poverty, stigma, you know, all of these different things, you know, are going on. And so when we're talking about adherence, you know, that's just another challenge for some folks. So the goals of this program are really threefold. The first one is to help each and every client who is enrolled in the program achieve and maintain durable viral load suppression. That's really the hallmark of what we're trying to do. Um, when we initially launched the program, the number we were looking for is under 50 copies per milliliter, but now we've expanded to 200 copies or below. And that's primarily just because the science says that's also, you know, beneficial. Yeah. Um, to second goal is to celebrate the heroic actions of our clients. So you've already seen some of the imagery, which I'll talk a bit more about. And then lastly, just creating this agency-wide culture shift around ending aid here um, in our organization. So whether you're a provider or facilities or a case manager or administrator, we're all trained. We all have talking points of what it means to be virally support, suppressed and um, how we can support folks in that effort. Uh, next slide. So this is the program model in a nutshell, really quickly. So every person who's enrolled in the program, and once again, they have to be HIV positive because we're talking about suppression. Um, everyone is paired with a primary care provider within our agency. So that's like the first person on their team, you know, and so the provider is going to either, if they're not prescribed medication, getting them started, same day start if they're newly um, diagnosed. Uh, any kind of other comorbidities that may be going on, you know, we can cure hep C now. So maybe that would be something that the provider would prescribe and work with the patient on. But that's really the first person that's kind of um, assembled to be on their team. The second part is case manager. Um, also case, you know, care navigator. I know different sites call them different things, but this is a person that kind of handles all the non-clinical needs of the patient. So access to transportation or support with childcare or nutrition needs or helping them secure housing, you know, all of those other things that are just as critical as the medication themselves. Um, and oftentimes our case managers know the patient more intimately than our providers because they see them more often. So every person in the program is paired with at least one case manager. Some folks have multiple um, to really address those other needs. And the last one is the Undetectables Toolkit, which I'll get to on the next slide. But the key part of this um, image is that the client is at the center and the client is you know, bigger than the other parts. And that's really because we want to empower clients to be take ownership of their healthcare choices. We wanna empower them to you know, give them options and let them take the lead. You know, at the end of the day, we, you know, once again, that empowering message, Kamos, you know, there was a, the point about motivational interviewing, you know, all of those things really feed in the approach. 
Uh, next slide. So here's the toolkit and just for time I won't go through every single item, um, but really this is um, these are all evidence based strategies that have been proven to help support medication adherence, especially those um, on ARVs. So if you've ever heard about this program, the one item you probably are familiar with is this financial incentive. So clients who are enrolled in this program um, and they have achieved a suppressed viral load, which once again, currently we have 200 copies or below, that's the metric we're looking at. They are eligible to receive a $100 Visa gift card um, to spend as they wish. And they are um, eligible to get that gift card once a quarter. So long and short of it is that they can earn up to $400 per calendar year. And once again, we don't monitor what they spend it on. Some people spend it on bills or a mani-pedi or you know, something else. You know, we kind of get that anecdotally, but that's really something that to kind of get that incentive, that added boost to maybe get them in the door um, to be part of this. But that's definitely not all that it is. Um, it's paired with all these other things like adherence devices, support groups, um, case conferences where we have the provider, case manager, and the client together um, talking about what's going on, how can we support you, what am I going to do at the end of this conversation, let's check in at our next appointment next month to see how things are going, you know, a lot of that communication across the board, as well as all these other um, different things. And um, the point of the toolkit is that people can put things up, pick things up and put them down based on what's going on in their life. So maybe they were newly diagnosed. And so that support group is really key because they have no one else in their network to talk to. But maybe a year down the line, they've disclosed to their partner or family member and they have that network. So that support group isn't really as needed as before. So it's really meant to be tailored to whatever um, would be most beneficial for the client. Uh, next slide. So we did a pilot, a two year pilot when we initially launched. And like I mentioned, when we did this pilot, um, suppression was 50 copies or below. We really wanted to be specific on that part. And we found that the program worked. We saw that folks that were in the program, they were a 20% increase really in people that were virally suppressed during the time in the program. And that's something that we see still today, seven years later, we see double digit increases in viral load suppression when we look at folks in the program and those that are not enrolled in the program. Um, a lot of, you know, one of the biggest things we also saw is that populations that have often been regarded as tough to treat or challenging or having a lot going on, we saw that um, those disparities really oh, shrunk. Oh. Uh, those, uh, yeah, those, the, um, those disparities shrunk over time in terms of that. So we really reaching those that needed the most support um, as well. And then we also were inter doing an integrated healthcare model. Our case managers and our data folks and our providers and our clinic directors, they were all communicating in a better way. So folks weren't falling through the cracks as they have often did previously. So we really were communicating better and keeping folks engaged, which is really key um, for all of those things. Uh, next slide. We have a great website, liveundetectable.org that you know does lots of what I'm talking about today. Um, there's resources for people providing services, as well as people who just want to learn more about HIV in general. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, part on our website, you can download for free. We actually have three comic book editions that are available in English and Spanish, free of charge to download as a PDF. Um, and we found that people really love these stories. Uh, back to that empowering message, there's five um, specific characters that um, make up the undetectables, almost our version of the Avengers, if you will. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everyone has their own story. You can even do a quiz to see which character, you know, best aligns with your personality. Uh, but they kind of team up and fight these villains, you know, named like phobia or stigma, just a kind of a cool way to talk about um, HIV. We even weave in some conversations around PrEP as well. So definitely encourage, you know, folks to check that out on our website. Um, it's not just youth that really resonate with this. We've seen this across the board with all of our patients. So definitely a free resource to you. Uh, next page or next slide. Uh, you can also, you know, all of the programs we've expanded beyond housing work. So there's seven organizations throughout New York City that offer this program. And so um, if you're based in New York City, you can add your name to, or you can find a location near you. 
Um, also, my role is world domination with the undetectables. So we're <laughs> often seeking to, um, we get lots of interest from across the country of folks who want to implement either our version of the program or something similar. So I'll be more than happy to kind of have those conversations as well. Uh, next slide. So progress to date, like I said, it's been a little, little over seven years since uh, we first launched. So we have over 2,500 people. We um, we had 13 agencies total. We reduced it just because there was a different funding stream for certain agencies that has since um, terminated. Um, but we've, you know, a lot of folks have been engaged in this program across the uh, different agencies. So that's really exciting to see. Um, many of these agencies are funded by a grant by our, the New York City Department of Health. And many, many of them continue to be engaged in care. We continue to have high viral suppression rates as well across the agencies. Um, and then, uh, let's see, two years now, excuse me, uh, Amedicare, which is a Medicaid um, insurance plan based primarily in New York City. They actually have created their own version of this program that they offer to folks that are enrolled in their insurance. So it's kind of, it's really exciting to see it initially came out of a health center, but now insurance plans are really excited about incentive based um, viral load suppression programs um, and they've enrolled well over a thousand people since um, then and so really expanding people have been resonating with it and you know suppression rates really have improved because of these kinds of offerings. Um, next slide. So really briefly, you know, as I close, just wanted to mention technical assistance. So I know we often get questions of how did you come up with the amount or how successful is it or what roadblocks did you come across when thinking about creating this program? And so us at Housing Works, we are more than happy to provide technical assistance once again to you if you think it's something that you might want to explore. Um, since we've been doing it for seven years, I'm sure we've come across almost all questions you can think of. And so want to be able to share that as a resource to you all. Uh, next slide. Really briefly, funding a program, there's lots of different ways to potentially do it. You know, like I mentioned, we initially were funded by a private foundation. Now we've been funded through the New York City Department of Health. Um, there's 340B drug discount programs. There's lots of different ways to think about funding a program such as this. Uh, next slide. So this is just a really quick slide. If you were thinking about it, what would this cost or how big of a grant or funding opportunity would I need to consider? And it's really up to you of how big you might want to um, offer this program. It could be as small as maybe a 20,000 grant up to 100,000 grant, really just thinking through different things. Um, but the way we approach it is that there's really three core areas to consider. One is the incentives. Obviously, that's really a key piece of it, up to, once again, $400 per calendar year. If they're suppressed at each quarter. Um, staffing, maybe it could be in-kind, maybe it's a part-time, maybe it's a full-time coordinator, you know, just having someone who to kind of make sure to manage everything. And then lastly is like social marketing, which it's not required, but you know, who doesn't like swag, right? Who doesn't, you know, those images, the comic images are really unique, especially oftentimes when you see other, you know, standard public health marketing campaigns. So it could be little things like t-shirts and buttons um, to, I know we at Housing Works actually did um, like full size comic books um, characters. So when you go into the walking room, you take your picture, you know, there's lots of different ways to kind of engage with this content because we want it to be a talking piece regardless of your status. You know, everyone should know something about HIV and what they can do to prevent transmission. So we just really you know, like to make it a visible space. It doesn't just live within that clinic room with a provider. I'm busy. <laughs> Oh, um, and then next slide, I think. Uh, and then I know we have folks from lots of different places. And so um, I know at Housing Works, we have primary care, behavioral health, and case management all internal within our own agency. But some other folks, you know, maybe my agency has only case management, but I'll partner with a local health center that, um, and they would provide the primary care. So it doesn't necessarily all have to be one agency. It could be a network of folks working together. And we have seen that work very successfully as well. So that's an option. Um, there's lots of, you know, obviously rural um, areas may have some challenges. I do know that some programs who, some folks have looked into this that live in a more rural area, you know, obviously they use telehealth, transportation, other kinds of ways of keeping folks engaged. Um, and so there's certain things that we uh, have seen work successfully for folks that, you know, can't always come together as well. 
Um, so obviously when pursuing funding, there's limited resources in the world, of course. And so just being mindful of how, you know, you don't have to do it all alone. You know, I'm sure there's lots of folks already working together. So this could just reinforce um, your efforts. Uh, next slide. And yeah, I think this is my last slide, but just in terms of how we approach implementation and if you would be interested in learning more and once again, seeing if this might be a good fit. Um, you know, we work with agencies to kind of explore this model. We have this readiness assessment that we kind of work, walk through together to see what assets do you currently have? What are some areas that we might need to improve? Just to get a sense of, you know, your ability to pursue something like this. We provide all the training and startup, technical assistance, you know, whether it's our chief medical officer, myself, which is more an administrator, case management leadership, you know, we really want it to be tailored to whatever support that you need. And then lastly, just implementation in general, you know, we're, um, as you roll out this program, you know, we're happy to check in, touch base with you, solve problems as they come up. Um, but at the end of the day, it, we try to not view this as a brand new program. It's once again, just reinforcing the work that a lot of agencies who provide healthcare services um, just to bol bolster what you're already doing. Um, I think that's the next slide. Yep. So that was my really quick spiel about the undetectables. Um, you know, this is my contact information. Once again, I'm more than happy to chat more in depth. Check out our website, liveundetectable.org, that has all this other great information. We have a lot of info on undetectable equals untransmittable, which I know a lot of folks um, refer their clients to to learn more. Um, but yeah, I guess I'll just stop there and invite group everyone to um, share any questions, reactions, thoughts. Thanks, Naomi. Let's give Naomi a round of applause. Thanks. No. <laughs> oh, I love this. <laughs> Thank you again for having me. Thanks, Naomi. There's some really cool features to your program. I obviously will open it up. And just quick, quick things, things I really noticed right off the bat was you're talking about having everyone in your organization know about viral suppression. I really like that sense of culture, like you're, you know, the whole culture of the organization is helping promote people to viral suppression. That's really cool. And then you're talking about the, the toolkit and really just having something available for people to kind of pick up things as they need it in that point in their life. That's always really hard for us to guess <clears throat> what people need. So if we have come different opportunities, different resources that they can pick up as they need them, that's, that's a really nice feature. It was a great, very, um, very uh, practical presentation too, Naomi. I appreciated very much your putting in the, what does it cost? How do you need to staff it? Frequently people mm -hmm. don't share those details and they're, they're critical yeah. for people deciding to adopt. So anybody have any questions for Naomi? No, no questions. Uh, Naomi, I, I echo what um, many have said, a really great presentation. Uh, your integration of design, not only as a mindset for how the program is implemented, but then also the, um, the implementation of the program, even down to the technical assistance. Uh, really appreciate uh, like how um, you guys are utilizing digital as a smart depository for information, not only for individuals, but then also providers, because then it gives that, that openness to, we are building a community of practice that all have this universal framework and that what we explore to be unique is still grounded in the practice in which you guys are doing um, that care. Um, definitely, uh, and like, and this is probably um, a nerd moment for me, a lot of people like um, mix up social media marketing with social marketing. So I love the fact that you would like social marketing. I was like, I hope she um, talks about social marketing, not social media <laughs> marketing, which I was like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the idea in which we utilize marketing frameworks to make something applicable for everyone. So I like that you highlighted that. How can we use this framework to help build understanding and education around everyone? Um, definitely in favor of the metrics. Um, 
around like the toolbox, even from the pre-implementation, it's all through very well designed, you know, um, mm -hmm. I think didactic, even down to the, um, the project. Um, I would say that, you know, um, to, you know, our peers that this is a model of where we see like something practical, something accessible, but then also from a visual aspect, how something can be applicable, both visibly how we're consuming it and shareable for those that we want to um, consume it and utilize it. So very well job. I'm a fan. I will be calling you because uh, this is this this had definitely like lit up my day. So I really appreciate it. And kudos to the housing work. We got some friends over there. So I'll message you tell some folks to say hello. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much those for your kind words. Really appreciate it. We have one question, one question, Naomi, from Lisa Klein. Can you see it in the chat? Let's see, any more info on DOT? Is that being oftentimes? Yeah. So yeah, DOT is definitely something that we use quite a bit. Um, we have specific parameters of who qualifies for DOT or who is an appropriate candidate. Um, but no, we find that's helpful, especially for folks who are in, we have an ADHC case management program, adult day healthcare, where they're coming into our locations two, three, four times a week usually. So we would do DOT there because we're physically seeing them. Some of our clients in our congregate housing units. So once again, we know where they are. We can actually do DOT on a daily basis. So I would say definitely um, not everyone, of course, but it's definitely utilized by a fair proportion of our patients, um, whether they're in the undetectables or just HIV positive and um, receive primary care. Um, let me see. I see. Ooh, I see some more questions popped up in the chat. Let me see. Skamer, I love the idea of creating materials. I think sometimes gets too simple. Okay. Yes. No, totally, Michael. I think people really love that just seem it's something different. You know, we actually print out those comic books and put them in our waiting rooms or use them as if there's a new patient that's coming to our primary care clinic for the first time, we'll give them a water bottle or, you know, different ways of just kind of engaging folks. So I think uh, that's one of my favorite parts of the comic. So I uh, see more about the funds. There have been sites that have interest in this intervention. So thinking through the funding incentives piece. Yeah, um, I will be completely frank. I'm still, I'm newer to the 430B um, just um, and all the ins and outs. But what I can say is that uh, a lot of the savings that we do get from the, um, from from three, uh, 340B, excuse me, do help us fund the incentives portion of our program. You know, we do have a grant from the local city department of health, but since we've initially launched this program, our enrollment numbers have really ballooned. So that grants, you know, we've grown, grown that grant. So we have been able to fund that as well as um, we have a hep C version of this program um, as well. And those 340B funds help cover those incentives, which since we can cure hep C, you know, it's obviously it's a shorter program, but um, definitely happy to talk more if, um, of how we set that up and how we do that if you have interest in that. All right, well, we should actually stop here, Naomi, just to make sure we have time for our case presentation, but uh, yeah. certainly.